the grave Break into the wild And don't be afraid And run into wide open spaces Grace is waiting for you And dance like the weight has been lifted Grace is waiting
may be formed but it won't prosper when the darkness falls it won't prevail cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph and my God will never fail my God will never fail and I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, 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 oh. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus And every war he wages he will win And I'm not backing down from any giant I know how the story ends Yes, I know how the story ends
Good morning, Advanced Church, and welcome back to our series, This Is Us Online Edition. Uh, this is part three, and if you missed the first two, I definitely encourage you to go to YouTube and Facebook and watch those. And what we wanted to do today was um, give a little snippet or a window into our lives, um, not on an individual level, but actually on a relationship level. We've been asked a lot over the years, just of advice about counseling and relationships and, and how to understand each other and what works, what doesn't work, what we've learned. And today we just want to share a little bit about how we kind of came together, um, but also the things that we've learned over the last couple of decades uh, that has been so invaluable to our relationship. Derek asked me to share a few minutes of how we met. I think he asked me because he doesn't remember. Oh. <laughs> Just teasing. Um, it's a bit of a complicated story because there is seven years between us. So we did. I'm, I'm the older one. <laughs> we did meet several times before, um, obviously not caring that we met ever. Um, but I would say that when we became really good friends was when um, Derek was in a trio at our church and one of them needed to go move off to university. And so our music pastor suggested that I come in as the replacement. And she was a great one, by the way. <laughs> and from there, um, the three of us actually... Uh, the other Julie became my best friend. Derek became my other best friend. We spent a lot of time together. And from there, it progressed into what we have now, where we became best friends. And I can truly say I married my best friend and never have regretted it. Um, just before I jump in and ask Derek some questions, I just wanted to address maybe some younger viewers or those who are looking to enter into a relationship. I've been asked several times, like, what advice would I give? And, you know, that's a difficult question because it's been a long time, so maybe I'm not the right person to ask. However, this is my two bits, you know. If you're looking for a certain type of person, like a stand-up person, somebody who loves the Lord, somebody who prioritizes proper things, who takes care of themselves, and you know that that person, my number one piece of advice was to is to be that person. That if you want someone who's completely in love with God and prioritizes Him, then then that's what you need to do. That's how you will attract that type of person as well. And I can say that's true in our relationship that I was looking, I had a very specific list. I was looking I had a for a really <laughs> long list, like super long. <laughs> I was looking for a green eyed guitar playing um, man of God and with a sense of humor. And I got a green eyed guitar playing man of God with a sense of humor. So that's awesome. Um, it's a good time to tell you I wear colored contacts. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. I, I do agree. Um, Can I just say this morning that it's really hot on the day that we're doing this recording, so if either one of us faints, I will do my best to edit that out. Okay, you can continue. Yeah, so um, I'm going to ask you, Derek, because this is something that we've been asked many times because uh, we've been married now for almost 21 years. And I would say most of those have been happy. <laughs> no, they've been happy. Uh, we do get asked this a lot. And so I'm going to ask you, is for you to answer, uh, what is your best advice to build a strong marriage or to strengthen your marriage? That's a pretty loaded question. And, you know, the answer that I give may be different from other uh, advisors, but I think I'm going to answer this from two perspectives, um, a spiritual perspective and a practical perspective. When I was a young man, um, when I talk about the spiritual side, when I was a young man, someone brought my attention to the triangle. I don't know if some of you know what I'm talking about, the relationship triangle. <laughs> they drew this triangle and at the top of the triangle at that point they put the word God and then at the other two corners was you know the husband and the wife and <clears throat> I was taught that if a husband pursues his spouse and vice versa then they're gonna draw closer from their points of origin but that doesn't necessarily guarantee that they're gonna grow in their relationship with God 
And he said, you know, Scripture teaches us to put God first. It's not just in one place. It's all through Scripture that God needs to be number one. So even in your relationships, God needs to be number one. And the advice was to put God into the relationship, put him at the top and the priority of the relationship, so that as, as each person from their own point of origin pursues God, and you'll see it, um, almost always their relationship grows between the two of them. They're getting closer as they're getting closer to God. You know, I'm reminded of one of my favorite scriptures in James 4 where it says, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. I think a lot of people think there's a huge gap between um, God and you, and, and, and there is. Sin separates us for sure. But Jesus bridged that gap. And when it says to draw near, he'll draw near to you, it doesn't mean that he's just sort of waiting and waiting. God's always pursuing us. And as soon as we take that step towards him, it's like he runs to us. I've just found that that's so true in our relationship that as we have pursued God, together and individually, it has drawn us together. I, I, there are so many stories that, that could have ended up so differently if we hadn't put God at the center of our relationship. So I think my biggest advice is put God at the center of the relationship, right? At the priority and pursue him first. Because if you're both pursuing him, you're naturally going to draw uh, closer together. So that would be my spiritual um, advice. Uh, the practical side comes from more of a, an experience. I, I come from a divorced home. My parents divorced when I was nine. In fact, uh, my father's father was divorced and his father before him was divorced. And so as a young man, I'm like, I want to I wanna stop this pattern. If I'm going to enter into a relationship with somebody, I don't want to end up divorced, divorced, divorced. And so even before, you know, I was engaged or married, I remember taking both of my parents aside separately and, and interviewing them, actually. Because, you know, I was nine, so I didn't fully understand the story of why it all fell apart. And there were certain things that were obvious and that I knew, but I didn't really know from their perspective what, was, what, what were the things that sort of broke down in the relationship. And so I asked my mother, I asked my father separately, and many things did come up that were obvious, some not so obvious. But two things came up that I would say that was probably at the top of both of their lists. And they said that the number one reason that their relationship broke down was communication. And secondly, and closely related, was honesty. Now, um, when I think of those two words, I think, well, that... Like, well, you're communicating, so isn't that just honest? Well, not necessarily. So I, I think a better word to use is probably transparency. Because you can communicate in a relationship and not have that vulnerable transparency uh, as an individual to each other. So, for instance, if someone says, hey, are you doing okay? And you say, yeah, I'm fine. Have you communicated? Yes. Have you communicated with honesty and transparency? Probably not. <laughs> In our experience, the answer is, is usually much longer than, no, I'm fine. <laughs> and so communication is huge. But in that communication, you have to be transparent with one another. Um, our relationship wouldn't be where it is today if we hadn't had these long talks about uh, how one of, one of each other has hurt one another or didn't understand one another or was angry and we had to talk it through communication is huge but for us to be transparent and honest has been a key part of that communication i would second that i would say my number one piece of advice um, and it is to those entering marriage and to those struggling in their marriages is most often to make honest communication a daily priority. Now, to those who this is not normal for, it probably sounds ridiculous, if not impossible, but I am standing here and I'm telling you that that's the goal. Maybe you're not going to blink your eyes and that's going to happen tomorrow, but that's what what you're working towards is that daily honest communication, um, whether it's, you know, 10 seconds or 
10 minutes or 10 hours, um, it's a priority to make sure that you're in constant, honest, transparent communication. I heard um, one marriage seminar describe it as, uh, as they do in Genesis, where it talks about Adam and Eve in the garden, and they were naked and unashamed. And that kind of open honesty, everything sprawled out before each other, but they're not ashamed. They're together. They are loved. That's the ideal relationship, right? Where they know the best and the worst parts of you at any point and they still love you and they're still working with you. So I would second that, that that would be the most common advice we would give is make communication a daily priority. Now, when we're talking about communication, um, my next question or the most often next asked question is what exactly do you mean by communication like what does communication in marriage what can it look like and what should it look like in marriage well let me at least start with this that the the goal of communication is not to get them on your side is not to make your spouse agree with you the goal of communication is for each of you to be heard and for each of you to be respected. You will find that there are times when you just won't agree. But if you can hear each other, if you can respect one another, that, that is a huge part of the goal. I mean, Scripture tells us to be slow to speak and quick to listen. Meaning, I can't control you. I can't control how you're, you're going to understand or react. But I can control me. And Scripture is telling me that I need to hear you, that I need to submit to you, I need to respect you. These are the things that we're taught in Scripture. And so if we understand the goal of communication is not just to make them, you know, get what I want, that's not the point. We, we need to respect each other and, and hear each other out. So I think that's really important that we, we understand that. We have some like real practical advice about communication and we're just going to kind of rip through them together yeah. uh, and hopefully this really helps you not only to communicate with your spouse but with others as well in any relationship but i think um the first one that we would want to say is to be intentional and plan ahead we can't assume that these really great conversations are just going to happen on the fly as the kids are screaming at us or we're really tired or or whatever's going on in our life we have to be intentional about creating a space and a time for this to happen and I'm not just referring to oh we've got issues and we need to talk about them I'm not saying that I'm saying creating a regular ongoing time place space to communicate about life the good the bad and the ugly all of it that that it's always there at least um that we have it looking forward to it, that it's on the calendar, that it is a priority. Just to give a uh, testimony to how we work. Now, this is not going to work for everybody, but we are both night owls, so this works for us, yeah. is that we've created that space at the end of the day when the kids go to bed, although they're going to bed very late now, very late. so we are up very, very late. Um, <laughs> And that's probably not a good idea for some of you out there, but for us, that works. It's just a bit of quiet space where there's, you know, half hour to ourselves to talk about things, talk about our day, to recap, be with each other, play a game, do whatever we would like to do in that half hour. And it's ours. And sometimes we stay up really, really late to get that. Uh, but it is such, it's been such a worthwhile investment. It's how we are doing so well, I would honestly say. And I would say another thing that's really important is to learn your spouse's communication needs. You know, when we talk about premarital counseling and we offer for uh, our advice, we always you know, mention a book uh, called The Five Lo Love Languages by Gary Chapman. And it's a book about understanding how you receive love and how you give love and in respect, how your spouse receives and gives love. And I think in communication, it's just the same. No one communicates the same. No one is exactly, you know, the words and the thoughts. They're all different, and, and we kind of clash quite often as human beings, not just men and women or husband and wife. 
And so it's so important that we understand each other's communication needs. Um, I think for an example would be I learned very early on that when Chandra has my attention, she needs my eyes on hers. You know, even for a while, she didn't even know why. But for her, it just brings this comfort that you're, you're with me, that you're not distracted, that the things that you're saying, I'm capturing. Um, I'm not the same way. She could be doing dishes and I'd be talking to her and that's fine. Uh, some of the things that I need is, is for her to be very blunt. I need her just to say what you need to say. I, I don't need the long drawn out story. Just get to the point. Um, which frustrates her because she likes to voice her story. <laughs> so we've kind of have to work it together. even feels counterintuitive or rude to be that pointed. Like, yeah. I need you to do this. Sometimes it feels rude from my perspective, but I've learned, like, that's what he wants me to say. Just say what you need. Uh, the next thing I would say is to be your spouse's biggest encouragement. You know, communication is one thing and saying, hey, this is how I'm feeling. This is how you hurt me, whatever. But communication also needs to be like, I am your biggest fan. Uh, you're beautiful. I think you're an incredible teacher. I think you are one of the best moms I've ever seen in action. You are literally the best and resourceful person I have ever met. These are things that you, you just put into them. Being an encourager in your relationship is so important that your communication isn't always fixing what's wrong. Communication is just, you look amazing today in that dress or in those jeans or whatever it is. I was thinking about you at noon because you're just awesome. Like these are things that are so important to do invest into each other. And so when your communication is just the negative, like, hey, we need to have a talk. You know that, that phrase, hey, we need to have a talk. There is this connotation that is negative. It's like, hey, we need to talk. And I just need to tell you once again how proud of you I am, how, how beautiful I think you are. And I will. I'll just take times, walk by her in the kitchen, and just whisper these, these words of affirmation and respect into her. So make sure that you, you speak encouragement, that you're the biggest fan for each other. Uh, another great, helpful piece of advice for us is to see problems as hurdles for you to jump over, not f for you to just throw at one another. I think when things get really stressful, all of these principles are really hard and you know, you're tired, you're stressed, you're, you're angry, you're impatient or whatever, or, and there's an issue going on, uh, financial difficulty or one of the kids constantly misbehaving or something. And we try to like tend to throw like, well, it's your fault. If you only couldn't you do this or whatever. And if, if we could communicate in such a way that we see the problem as like out here rather than in between us, like, no, you're the problem. No, she's the problem, but it's just a problem. It's just a problem. And together you're going to face that problem. And you're probably going to have to talk about different solutions. Some of them might work. Some of them might fail miserably, but if you can see that you're a team and that you're facing this together you're facing the lack of time together or the lack of energy or the lack of finances or whatever you're facing it together that you're the team facing the problem rather than the problem being here and we're arguing this way I mean that has really helped us over the years because we have problems everyone has problems so just see them as hurdles rather than weapons <laughs> Uh, next, I would say to have proactive talk instead of reactive talk. Uh, because we do communicate so differently, because we're such different people, and I'm not just talking, Chandra and I, I'm talking everybody, it's really important that you don't react in your communication, that you're proactive in how you handle that communication. We always teach in premarital counseling, we teach couples how to communicate. And it's, it seems like a silly exercise, but it's something that we, we have found to be so valuable. So we'll take an issue that they've dealt with maybe that day or that week um, that maybe they've gotten over so the emotions are out of it. But we really want to walk them through, okay, you're going to say something to your spouse. And then your spouse is going to say, this is what I heard. And we, and we clarify. We even use those words. This is what I heard you say. This is what I think you meant. And you try to say it in your own words, 
what they said. And then the other spouse can then respond and say, yes, that is what I meant. Or no, actually, I meant this. And I think that exercise in our marriage for over two decades has has proven so valuable because we, we just stop reacting and we're proactive to hear and listen and intentionally try to understand. One of the number one reasons why we fight is because we've misunderstood the other person. We've assumed that they were attacking us or belittling us or demeaning us or something awful that they weren't saying at all, misunderstanding one another. And instead of explaining it, um, we're just going to, I'm going to explain it and then we're going to do an example and it might get cut. Okay. Um, <laughs> we're going to make up a fictitious argument or something that's upsetting me or upsetting you. All right. So let's give a mini example. Make up a something that I did. When you leave the cupboard doors open. Which I do. I think you are intentionally trying to hurt me. <laughs> be serious. Because, oh, but no, that's true. There is some <laughs> truth to that because I hit them with my head. I hit them with my shoulder. Uh, put aside the fact that I wasn't looking properly, but I will hit them with my knees. I think you're trying to hurt me and sabotage me. Uh, on a serious side, um, I think you just don't care that it's a danger to somebody walking by or I don't want to look at the inside of the cupboards. I, I bought the outside of the cupboards to look nice. That's what I want. Okay. So in, in a bad scenario, this is how this would go. If I'm feeling heated and if I'm not, if I'm not clarifying what he's saying, I would react like, you think I'm actually trying to hurt you? What's yes. wrong? Why do you think I'm like that? Why do you bruise? Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe you would even think that and the anger would escalate and it's just a misunderstanding. The goal of the exercise would be to clarify what he's saying. So what I heard you say was, and we often use those words. So what I heard you say was that when I leave kitchen cupboards open, it just really annoys you. Is that what you said? Well, yes. And that you're trying to hurt me. So you feel like I'm intentionally trying to hurt you when I leave cupboard doors open? Yes, that is correct, Your Honor. <laughs> so the clarification is there, and now I can know exactly what I'm even trying to respond to, because clearly that wouldn't be my intention. Or is it? <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Okay, this clarification of communication, it seems stupid, doesn't it? But I am telling you, it works, okay? Clarify what is actually being said before you respond to something that somebody's not even saying, okay? So and that takes a lot of practice. Uh, we've gotten much better at over 20 years, but it's a great, great way. And here's what I've noticed from the beginning of our relationship to now, a couple of decades later, is that at the beginning, you really didn't understand each other. Like, you'd never had this argument before. It was all very new. You're still learning the way they use words and actions and all of that stuff. And so there's misunderstanding because you're ignorant. The problem with being in a marriage a long time is that you see patterns. And so you get emotional even before the conversation has ended or started or halfway through a sentence, you're already assuming what she's saying. And that is a mistake as well. Just because there have been patterns doesn't mean that every time she says this word or makes that gesture or goes, oh, that it means something the same every time. And I think by using that, you know, because we've caught ourselves. Well, that's not what I meant. I literally was just out of breath because I came up the stairs and I'm fat. Okay. It wasn't a sigh of disgust. I'm just tired and I'm out of breath. Like, and, and I have to com communicate that for her to say, okay, well, in the past, you have sighed like that, and it meant you were disgusted with me. And so you have to go back and forth and go back and forth in your own way to come to some kind of understanding, not necessarily an agreement. That, that's really important. There are some times that you will never agree on something. But if we can at least understand each other, that is a huge goal. Or validate each other's perspective, yeah. even if you don't totally understand it. Clarify what you've heard before you respond to it or react to it. 
This will avoid unnecessary conflict when it's just a miscommunication. That's all. They didn't even even mean that. Uh, Another helpful tidbit is uh, to reset quickly. Uh, I like those words better. Um, Basically, it's code word for forgive and get over it quickly. But resetting actually is a good word for me because um, sometimes we'll be in, in a bit of a conflict or misunderstanding one another. And you know, you get that place where your nerves and your emotions and everything are elevated and you're a little bit on edge. And we have learned, and it has taken us a long time, to reset quickly where, where the other person says, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. To let that be true, yeah. to, to give them the benefit of the doubt. Okay, they didn't mean that. I forgive you. We're resetting. I'm not going to be like, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to reset, forgive, and assume that they didn't mean that and move on. Like, I don't know. Help me out. Well, I think some of you are probably thinking, but he does it all the time. <laughs> he does it all the time. And what did Jesus tell Peter when he said, how many times do I have to forgive? And Jesus like, a lot, Peter, a lot. <laughs> Just keep forgiving. Don't get out of the practice mm-hmm. of forgiving because we are human nature, selfish people. We're going to make mistakes constantly. And if we're not people of grace, mm-hmm. like God is with you and with me, then we're missing the whole point of God's love and forgiveness in our own lives. We need to be exhibiting that in everything, especially to the one we hold most dear. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness doesn't mean that um, what they're doing is okay necessarily or that it doesn't annoy you. What it does is release them from your wrath. (laughs) Like, okay, you said that and it did hurt my feelings and I will have to deal with that. There's not no consequences, but I'm not necessarily going to be like, you hurt my feelings. And then the next time we have a fight, I'll be like, remember that time when you hurt my feelings? Those are the things that we reset. Like that's in the past. Yes, I will have to deal with those consequences. But you know, Jesus really does heal the heart. He really can heal the the hurts that you've been given. And you would want your spouse to do the same for you. You would like people to give you a re-second a reset button, a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance, even in the small things like, you know, I leave cupboard doors open and it drives Derek crazy. And it's been 21 years eh, and I try, but there is this constant like, Hey hun. And he'll close the door in front of me. Like, remember, just close the door. I'll show her the bruise <laughs> of walking into it again. <laughs> But we all appreciate being recipients of somebody just resetting quickly and being gracious and loving and giving us things that we don't deserve. And so my advice would be then be the donor of that. Give that grace to your spouse that you want in return. So maybe if we can just sort of um, finish our morning with kind of a practical question. You know, it's easier to do good things and be good in your relationship when things are going well. But we all know that life throws curveballs your way and there's disappointments and losses of job and loss in general. Uh, There are things that bring stress into our lives. What do we do in our relationships when we're bombarded with difficulties? That is a good question because outside stresses definitely affect marriages. Absolutely. COVID-19. Yeah, absolutely. That is a very real thing. Um, But honestly, I would say that all of the previous advice that we just gave uh, is still absolutely applicable. And you know what? None of us are going to do this perfect perfectly. We're going to look at this list and be like, that is absolutely impossible to achieve. Well, you know, we don't have to improve everything all of a sudden and completely change our lives today. Take one thing, take one thing that God puts on your heart to work on, to install something that you think might be helpful advice for you in this, in this season and work on that. It's as simple as that. It's, it's not, I shouldn't say simple. Um, but there's no, there's no extra pressure from us from anyone else it's a it's a journey i know that some people hate when i say that but it's true it is a journey you get through it one step at a time so take one thing 
that maybe would be a useful piece of advice for you and make that a priority. And as you started this um, this morning, you talked about growing closer with God, drawing you closer with your spouse. And I would say even if one spouse is not doing that, that drawing closer to God enables you to do this. I we we talk a lot about the supernatural love that we have for one another that goes beyond our flesh, that goes beyond like I don't really feel like doing that today. I'm actually really mad at you and I don't feel like forgiving you and things that we can't produce in and of ourselves. That's what the Holy Spirit does for us. We bring it to him and be like, I want to love him. I want to forgive him. I want to communicate better. I want to do all these things that I should. But God is the one who directs, who leads, who guides, who enables us to do these things. So in times of difficulty, especially lean on God as to what you should be focusing on. And you know, you're not going to be able to focus on all of this, but count on God to reveal to you what you should be focusing on today. And this I think week. it's so important that we we understand this isn't about formula and this isn't about cookie cutter marriage. You know, Shauna and I are a very different couple than the next couple. And and I think you've nailed it on the head here that allowing the Holy Spirit to guide your relationship uh, all these points that we've kind of shared have, have been the guidance of the Holy Spirit. It's things that he's taught us that work for us. And so we're just kind of spilling that out to you and saying, take what you can use, take what helps you as a couple, but lean on the Holy Spirit. That's probably the most important thing that you can take from this morning. And I honestly say we have miracle stories of Holy Spirit intervention. Like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. And then God drops something into our heart, into our mind, and it mends and love pours out and a miraculous outcome where there seemed to be no miraculous outcome possible. And so uh, we just encourage you to, to dig into who God is and, and do it together, but do it individually. And recognize that so often that will draw your relationship so much closer than you ever thought possible. And you, you mentioned it just a second ago, this supernatural love. I, you know, we hear the cliche, I love you more today than I did the day we got married. It's true. <laughs> it's so true. We've been through so much. But there is something supernatural, a love inside of me that God has given me for her and her for me. And because of that... We're celebrating 21 years in a, in a couple months. I would just like to pray for all the marriages out there. Uh, strong, healthy, not so healthy, it doesn't matter. I'm going to pray for them all. And this is my prayer. Dear Jesus, I ask that you would intervene, that you would give each person a supernatural love for their spouse, that maybe they think they can't even, it's not even possible to love their spouse any more than they currently do. Would you surprise them, God? Would you enable them to love them even more, to, to serve one another better, to, to value one another even more, to communicate better? Um, for those that are struggling, God, we pray again for that supernatural love, a love that maybe is undeserved sometimes, but God, you love us unconditionally. And I pray that when our own fleshly love runs out, you would fill it with supernatural love and patience and wisdom and ways to communicate and divine direction. I pray God for um, a determinedness that to see, to see that it's worth it, to see it is so worth it. And I pray that there would be um, upcoming testimonies and that we would be flooded with good news in relationships with their spouse, in relationships with their kids. These are my, this is my prayer, God, and I'm asking that you would do that in Jesus' name. Would you guys have a great week, be very, very blessed, and love one another. Hey, I'm Pastor Derek. And I'm Pastor Shonda. And thank you for joining us here at Advanced Church Online. It's our hope for the church to help you deepen your relationship with Christ and strengthen your faith. And we would love to connect with you. And there's a number of ways that you can do that. You can email us, you can text us, or you can comment below. And of course, you can always visit our website to get more information about us. Thanks for joining us. See you next week.